Hello, everybody. This is Deacon Sakoni, Prince of the Liberty Missionary Baptist Church, or the Reverend Dr. Clyde May Jr. is our pastor. And today I'm going to be reviewing the Sunday School lesson coming out of the Faith Pathways book. But as always, we're going to start in a word of prayer. So let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus. Lord, thank you for another opportunity to call upon your name. We thank you, Father God, for allowing us to wake up this morning and see the dawning of a brand new day. God, we don't take it for granted. We love you, we appreciate you, and we thank you for who you are, not just for what you do. God, we love you for loving us, even how messed up we were, how messed up we are, you still love us, and we appreciate you for that. Now, Lord God, we ask you to give us wisdom and insight as we go into the study today. We ask that you would just be the teacher and let us be the students. God, speak to our hearts today as only you can, and we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, we pray and for his sake, amen. Amen. And yes, it is glasses time. We're studying lesson eight. The date is January the 22nd, 2023. We're in unit two, and the unit subject is God's promises. The lesson subject is living right over empty rituals. The fact devotional reading is Ephesians chapter five, verses 11 through 20. Background scripture is Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 through 14. The printed passage, however, is Isaiah 58, verses 6 through 10. And the key verse reads, If thou draw out thy soul to the hunger, to satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. Isaiah 58, verse 10. In fact, the lesson name says, that as a result of experience this lesson, you should be able to do these things. Summarize Isaiah 58 to determine the actions that God wants his people to take. Repent of ways and times when you have offered false rituals and prayers to God. Enact God's justice and mercy as an affirmation of God's will on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. The introduction says, despite their tremendous popularity, Luxury goods like designer watches, clothes, purse, and athletic shoes can be extremely costly, especially for the average consumer. The expansion of advertisement and social media and internet shopping has created an incredible demand for these items, especially among those who cannot necessarily afford them. The result has been an ever-increasing black market of counterfeit or look-alike products. But determined to make a certain impression or being either enabled or unwilling to pay like the price for the genuine articles, millions of people are perfectly pleased to live in the illusion of prestige that fake goods sometimes create. People may be fooled, and God may not judge you for wearing counterfeit Gucci watch or a Chanel scarf, but when it comes to worship, only one thing is acceptable, the real thing. And that is so, so true. The analysis of the biblical text, the first section says, so as stated. Isaiah 58, verses 6 and 7. And the word of the Lord reads, Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hunger, to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out of thy house? When thou seest the naked, and thou covered him, and thou hid not thyself from thine own flesh. The commentary says, in these verses, in the verses preceding those for the lessons text, God's people seem surprisingly confused concerning what he required of them. Like many modern day Christians, they have fallen into a pattern of shallow, superficial worship, as if going through the motions of worship would somehow fool or satisfy God. In response, God used a question to make his point and call the people to self to spiritual self-examination. What is the fast that I have chosen for you? Is this not it? Since ancient times, God's people have struggled 
get the temptation of offering God counterfeit worship. They show up in big numbers for grand celebrations, banquets, feasts, concerts, annual days, and programs, but are largely absent when it comes time to do things that matter most to God, studying the word, praying and fasting, and serving others. Many call on God with f fervent prayer and fasting when seeking fact, deliverance or a blessing from God, but show little or no interest in, in communing with God or seeking his guidance. God spoke through his prophet to address Israel's misguided worship. Even with good intention and a, and a sincere heart, it is possible for one to drift off course in his or her spiritual relationship. Therefore, every believer should periodically examine his or her spiritual life with this question in mind. Does my worship please God? Am I still focused on the main thing? God clarifies that fasting is a significant spiritual goal. It recharges the believer to experience a closer connection to God and deeper sensitivity to his priorities. Fasting turns the believer's heart towards expressions of true worship, service to others, helping those in bondage, in fact, relieving the oppressed, feeding the hungry, assisting the homeless, and clothing the naked. Notice the direct parallel between this list and the words of Jesus in Matthew 25, verse 35 through 36, concerning God's priorities and final judgment. In fact, regard for the hungry, thirsty, strangers, naked, homeless, the sick, and the in prison. Fasting gives sensitivity and strength to do the right thing concerning those in need. Did I, did I miss a page? Okay. All right, so it, it goes on to say, in fact, there's no time for the people of God to, in fact, to be distracted by minor in fact, denominational differences, worship style preferences, or other issues, and fail to be the light of the world. While going through a form and facet of worship, God's people failed to act lovingly towards others. They were guilty of neglecting the needy and withholding support from their own family members. Now, that's an indictment. And when it said so as stated, it wasn't like S-O, it was S-O-W, like to sow, to put in, to actually plant to invest, that's the type of sowing that it was referencing here. <clears throat> and you know, we can oftentimes get caught up again in the ritual of just doing things for the sake of doing them. And we can walk around with a badge of honor that I went to so many church services, I know so many scriptures, I taught so many Sunday school classes. That has nothing to do with our genuine worship of God, our genuine care for God's people, our genuine expression of our love for God through our service to other people. We serve him by serving each other. So if we just go on the fact that, okay, I've done this and I've done that. Well, you know, we sound like the guy that was in the temple praying with himself. How he said, I fasted so many days. I've given money to the poor and I'm not like this man. He was, he was heaping praise on himself. But we need to understand that we owe God a genuine praise, a true praise, an authentic praise. I mean, one that comes from the depths of our soul, one that realizes that without his help, without his guidance, without him intervening, we wouldn't be where we are today. We need to put ourselves in a position to where it's not even questioned anymore because God has been too good to us. He's done so much for us. We, it should be so evident that we are dependent on him, that we are where we are because of him, that we didn't get to our, this place on our own. It should be evident in our walk, in our talk, in how we communicate, in the way we live our lives with humility, realizing if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? There's a song that said, God, if you don't hold my hand, I can't run this race. And so we need him and we need our, our need for him should show up in, in, a, in the most genuine way with our, our heartfelt worship, our heartfelt devotion to him. 
can't say this enough. We have to examine ourselves. That's one thing the Bible is big on us looking at ourselves. Stop waiting for somebody else to judge you. You judge yourself because you know your motives. You know what it is you're doing. So, as is stated, we need to sow as stated. We need to invest. We need to pour in as stated. We need to do what God has called and given us to do from a genuine place, not just out of ritual. Oh, it's time to pay my tithes. Oh, it's time to go to church. Oh, it's time to teach Sunday school. No. Oh, I, I'm, I'm grateful I can pay my tithe. I'm thankful I can come to church. It's a blessing to be able to teach Sunday school because we realize God didn't have to do what he did for us. Some of us think that God is lucky to have us. We are blessed to have him on our side. I could keep going on that, but we got more lessons to study. So let's get on to these next couple of verses here. Section so said, reap the reward. So, so as stated, and this is reap like the reward. Isaiah 58, verse 8 through 10. And the word of the Lord reads, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily. And thy righteousness shall go back before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Then sh shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he will say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of the, the yoke, and put forth of the finger, and speak it vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hunger, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. Amen. The commentary says in the next section, God addresses the blessing of true worship. Those who combine their fasting and religious ritual with righteous living and love experience and specific set of blessings that beginning with answered prayer. They have lived lives full of light, healing, righteousness and the glory of the Lord. True worshipers move God to hear and answer their call and cries for help. God continues to outline the, the, the condition for blessings. To please God, believers must prioritize treating others with love and kindness. Specifically, they must refuse to participate in behavior that offends God, mistreating and oppressing people, mocking others, or casting blame and speaking evil of others. This section ends with a conditional promise for those who show sympathy and compassion to the hungry and victims of injustice. Their light will rise in the darkness and their and their night will become like the noonday it means that God will conform and provide for them. God will comfort and provide for them during their own time of trouble. The focus of the passage is that one's exterior spiritual life must be what it is, what is in his or her heart. Honoring and pleasing God requires authenticity that is not just spoken, but demonstrated by actions and attitudes of the heart that shows reverence for God and loving a regard for people. Amen. So again, we have the sowing and reaping. I believe it's in Genesis chapter 8 where it says that as long as earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest time. I believe it's 8 and 22. But there's seed time and harvest time. Uh, you know, there will be sowing and reaping. And this particular lesson, it points to that, to the importance of us doing the right thing for the right reason. And quite frankly, at the right time. We have to make sure that we are not out of step and out of tune with God. And that's why it's important for us to be in communion with him, to get our marching orders, to know what it is he will have us to do, when he will have us to do it. And then we can see the results that we intended and that we need. As we look at this, God is promising his people that if they would just make some adjustments, if they would get back to the basics, if they would return to their first love, how 
wonderful things would be, how God would turn their situation around, how he would fix what was broken if they just came with a sincere heart. And I know a lot of times people, they want to come up with every kind of excuse as to why they can't do that. But really, all of us have fallen short. All of us have made mistakes. All of us have fallen off the bandwagon of this Christian life. But all we have to do is repent, ask God forgiveness, turn our face towards heaven and start walking in that direction. I was telling somebody just this past week, you know, that the word in fact repent is not just to turn away from something. You're turning from one thing, but turning to something else. Uh, and in reference to In reference to our Christian life, we turn from sin, but to God. And we do that with the expectation, you know, like the Bible says, if we confess our faults, he's faithful. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our faults and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have a part to play. We have our responsibility for us to admit where we've fallen short, the things that we've done wrong, and for us to truly Bring honor and glory to God by how we live our life in the presence of other people, how we show forth his his goodness. And I tell you that it's it's doable, it's doable, but we have to examine ourselves. We have to be honest with ourselves. So many people lie to themselves about where they are, and what they do and how they do it. But if we just look at ourselves honestly, We'll see our need for a savior, our need for his help. We'll see our need for repentance, our need for just a cleansing and our need for honest worship. Because this lesson subject is living right over empty rituals. If your heart ain't in it, I really don't want you to. I really don't want you to do something for me if it's not in your heart to do. I mean, honestly, I really don't. If you're being forced to do it, if you're doing it out of obligation. My thing is this, look at your heart. I may need what it is you need to do for me, but if your heart isn't in it, that's something that you have to deal with. It's in your heart. I could go into something else, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm going to actually go to the closing thought, which says every church has its honor, tradition, and rituals. There's nothing wrong with participating in spiritual rituals if they do not depart from God's priorities. Programs, annual days, and special events should be secondary to the focus of biblical teaching, preaching, and activities that directly promote spiritual maturity and righteous living. God is concerned with, with, men, with ministry that serves the needs of people and glorifies him. And that is so true. Like I said, God doesn't have anything or a problem with uh, programs and annual days and all of that, as long as they do not negate what God is doing or wants to do in the body of Christ. The section that says your life, if it says, if a stranger were to ask, what makes you a Christian? What would you say? Reflect on the ways in which you live out your faith. Are you just a church goer or are you a true worshiper? Are you willing to make a greater commitment to serve people in Jesus name? And that's a good question. What makes you a Christian? And I'm going to let you answer that one. The next section, which says, in fact, your world says some Christians have given the church a bad name by focusing their time and energy on things that have nothing to do with biblical priorities. What are some specific ways that believers can make a difference in their communities and be more effective witnesses to the world by focusing on things that matter most to God? Again, I think it starts with our own, it starts with our heart, how we treat the people around us. 
It's not some grandiose, oh, I'm going out to, to do this for God. It's just, it's getting right with him and living with him and then letting our light shine. Not making it shine, but letting it shine. I remember as a child, I had a little, it was a glow in the dark baseball. It had like holes in it so you could play baseball at night. You could, you know, stick it by a light at a glow in the dark. You could throw it. People could see it. They could hit it at night. It was, it was a fun little tool or toe, I should say. Well, I remember having it in my room and I had my door closed, but I had the light on and I stood up on the bed and I held the ball up next to the light for as long as my little arm could hold it up. I took it down and I ran to turn the light off and I sat it on my desk and, and I laid in the bed and I watched it. I watched it until it slowly, and I mean, it took a, it took a good little while, maybe 10 minutes to where I couldn't even see it anymore. Then what I did was I got up, I turned the light on, got it, and I did it over again. I, I, in fact, remember that because I think about how as in fact, believers, as we're in the presence of God, we actually, we absorb the love, the forgiveness, the patience that God has for us. And then he sends us out into a dark world and we become that light. But there's a point to where you have to go back. You have to go back and get in his presence. But imagine if you did that on a regular basis, you wouldn't fade. You wouldn't look like everything else around you. So making it a priority to be in the presence of God is where our light comes from. Our connection comes from being in his presence, being with him and having him with us. As we go into a dark and evil world, people can see they see the light. They see something different about you. They don't know what it is. But there's something different about you and it's your relationship with God. It's him showing through you that really makes them curious and gives you an opportunity, you and I an opportunity to be able to actually tell them about the God that changed our life and continues to change us. I just wanted to throw that quick story in because I thought it was so fitting. All right. <clears throat> the closing prayer says, Dear, dear Lord, that may we grow in understanding what it takes to honor your name and we need to do that help us to avoid entanglements of being busy with things that do not matter and to focus on the heart of true spirituality loving you and loving others in jesus name we pray amen amen so again living right over empty rituals we have an opportunity to set an example of what it means to live a godly life. For those that are close to us, our husbands, our wives, our children, our parents, our siblings, our grandchildren, we have a chance to affect our nieces and nephews. We have a chance to show them, this is what it means to have a relationship with God, doing the good and bad times, the highs and the lows. And so, People, people can honestly tell how genuine we are. I mean, some people you can fool sometimes, but if they're around you long enough, they'll see you. They'll see what's up. They'll understand and know. <clears throat> but even more so, God knows. And that's the one that we're trying. That's who we're trying to please. That's who, that's who we are living to please, to please him. So I want to encourage you, I'm going to encourage all of us, even myself, to evaluate, our, to spiritually evaluate ourselves, to understand that we have to have a genuine and, and authentic worship with God. And to me, quite honestly, the way I do that, when I look at how messed up I am, when I look at the, the, the failures I've had this past week, oh, I see myself showering in God's love, showering in God's forgiveness, showering in God's patience and his grace and his mercy towards me. And then for my deodorant, that's what the Holy Spirit is for, to keep me, to preserve me so that I don't smell so bad as I go out the next week. But then I tell you what, I'm telling you, just as sure as I'm breathing, I'm going to mess up again. But it's that going back to God, it's that getting in his presence, it's that asking him for forgiveness, it's that appreciating the fact that he allowed me to come back again, not just a second time. He's not just the God of a second chance, he's the God of another chance. 
And so it's a it's 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 appreciating him for that. That's what really helps me. It makes it so much easier, in fact, for me to worship and thank him because I know it's not about me or my doing right or what I've, it's not about my righteousness. It's about his righteousness that he imputed on me because of what Christ did on the cross. And the fact that he loved me enough to do that, that should be reason enough to worship God. So we all have a chance. We all have an opportunity to live right over an empty ritual. And listen, let us close in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for this word, which reminds us of the importance of having authentic worship for you. Our love for you should be genuine and heartfelt. And God, we ask that you will help us to examine ourselves and be honest with ourselves as to where we stand and where we are with you. And God, help us to get closer to you because God, we can't do it on our own. We need your help to even get closer to you. We ask right now that you would just be with us. Give us the strength we need. God, give us the wisdom, the insight, the mindset we need. Give us the heart we need. God, to actually just be the people you're calling for us to be in these last and evil days. And Father, we thank you because we know that you're well able to do anything but fail. We thank you that you love us in spite of ourselves. We thank you that you continue to make ways for us day in and day out. And God, you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. Like somebody once said, God, not only have you been good, but you've been super good. And we thank you for that today. We pray and ask right now, Father God, that you would just help us to, God, to bring honor and glory to your name. And God, to live righteously over empty rituals. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We honor you. And we lift you up. In Jesus' name, we pray and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Well, this has been Deacon Zaccone, Prince of the Liberty Missionary Baptist Church, where the Reverend Dr. Clyde May Jr. is our pastor. I want to thank Pastor May for allowing myself and Reverend Frederick Robinson these opportunities to share these Sunday school lessons. Pastor May, I appreciate you more than you know. And to my co-labor in this endeavor, Reverend Frederick Robinson, I'm just amazed at where God is taking you and the things he's doing in your life. And I praise God for you and for your continued diligence in serving him. To Deacon L.K. Wimbush, the superintendent of our Sunday school, thank God for him and for the role he plays in making us one of God's greatest churches. To my wife, Yolanda, and to all of our children, Marcellus, Kristen, Jessica, Noel, and Jonathan. Well, Taylor's going by Noel now for those who are wondering if I had another child. No, <laughs> she's just using her middle name, but that's another story. But I thank God for all of my children. And I, I want to thank God for the Liberty Mission at Baptist Church, one of God's greatest churches, and for the privilege of calling it my church home. And I also want to thank God for you, for tuning in to this Sunday School lesson, to know that you can live right over having empty rituals. And listen, I actually would like and share this video so somebody else can get this valuable message. We'll talk to you soon. God bless. Bye.